Zero Latency takes virtual reality to a new level for Aussies. And game streaming promises a whole new level of fun, but does it deliver? Welcome to Vertical Hold, the tech show where we channel surf through the headlines in search of the big picture. I'm Adam Turner and I'm here with a man who remembers when Space Invaders was king, Alex Kidman. Alex, what's new in tech? Google's been bought out by itself. The company has announced a major restructure which sees Google, that's the company, owned by a new company called Alphabet, run by Google. Yes, it's terribly confusing, it's probably to do with tax minimization strategies. But as of now, Alphabet owns Google and possibly some other businesses as well. Optus has launched its Wi-Fi Talk app for Apple and Android, letting you use your mobile phone number even when you're in a mobile black spot. Calls aren't free, standard rates still apply even when you're calling out over Wi-Fi. Streaming service Stan has announced that it signed a multi-year deal with Warner Brothers Television for a number of its classic properties as well as new series. Highlights include the complete run of Friends, if you're still stuck in the 90s, as well as newer series such as The Flash and iZombie, which will apparently, from Season 2, run day and date with its US premieres. Virtual reality is boldly going where no man has gone before with the Space VR Kickstarter project proposing to send 12 360 degree cameras to the International Space Station. A subscription service will give you access to 360 degree video from the space station each week compatible with a range of VR headsets. So Alex, Optus is launching Wi-Fi Talk to help plug some of the black spots in its network. Is this a, a glass half empty or a glass half full sort of situation? Well, I, I guess it does depend, as, as all these things do, on how you look at it. I've got to say that I think it's probably, you know, it's excellent business for Optus hmm. because they get to offload a whole load of their network infrastructure onto the users yeah. themselves while making them still pay for the calls. It's brilliant for them. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a no-lose situation. I guess I can see if, you, if you're an Optus customer and you know that there's a spot where you've got a Wi-Fi network and you get really crappy mobile coverage, yeah, maybe it might save your bacon every once in a while, but I struggle to see why in a lot of those situations you wouldn't use a WhatsApp or a Viber or a Skype or any of the other existing Wi-Fi calling solutions that don't cost you anything. But this with incoming calls, that's the big difference there, is that if you're using the app and you're on your home network and you said, I want to use it on the home network, when someone tries to call you, it will divert the call to the app. So you can keep using your number for incoming calls and that's what you lose. You might have your, your WhatsApps or your Skypes or anything, but if you don't have mobile coverage, someone can't call your mobile. So that's sort of the, the, the sweetener to the deal. It's Yeah, it's the sweetener to the deal, but it's like a lot of these things that are using existing Wi-Fi. The, the, it's the same complaint we had with Telstra Air. That's that what I was going to say. You're it's giving a, up a whole bunch of stuff yeah. for a small benefit, which is a much bigger benefit to the telco. For them. I will yeah. say this. It is fairly brave of Optus because most telcos really don't want to talk about black spots. They really no. don't want to say, hey, there might be areas where you might get slightly shifty reception. And at least uh, Optus If you're said, with Optus, you know about black spots. <laughs> <laughs> They're not a theoretical Honestly, issue. Honestly, if, if you're with any telco, you know about black spots. They yep. all have their weak areas. Even though, I mean, Telstra is often held as the kind of gold standard for wide coverage. In some areas it is, in some areas it isn't. And I know people who swear roundly at Telstra but are aware that, you know, they're in an area where there might be quite a rich vein of, of Optus or even Vodafone, who yeah. often get dumped upon for having poor reception, have some areas where they've got excellent reception. It all comes and goes. This is a fix which is user-led rather than network-led, and on that basis, I think it's a glass-half-empty glass half kind of solution. So, Adam, I understand what zero latency is from a networking perspective, but as a game, well, what's this all about? Well, basically what they've done is they've taken the Oculus Rift headsets that a lot of people already know about, the virtual reality headsets. But with most Oculus Rift situations, what you do is you put on the headset, you plug it into a computer, you sit down in a chair, and you look around at the virtual world around you. What Until these... you get motion sickness and throw up. And so you get mo <laughs> if you're Alex, you get motion sickness and you throw up, right? Now, what, what these guys from Melbourne have done is they've taken the Oculus Rift and they've built on that. They've built lightweight backpacks that you carry on so the oculus carry around so the oculus rift plugs into the backpack then there's so there's a, uh, like a laptop or a 
or something in, inside the backpack, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's better hardware than that. But yes, yes, so there's a lightweight computer on your back. That once you're walking around in it, you don't even notice it's there. Then you can walk around in a, in a warehouse with tracking cameras around the ceiling to track your exact location. They all talk to a server in the corner that puts together the virtual reality world, decides where you are, and then wirelessly talks to your backpack to tell it what you should see through the headset. So that way, a few people can be in there at once, and the corner in the big computer in the corner is doing most of the grunt work, and you're not tied to anything. And they can even hand you a rifle, which shows up in the virtual world, at which point they you then get chased by zombies down alleyways, and it's very cool. Right, so this is this is the, the, the starting realisation of all the stuff that virtual reality has been hyped for for years. You know, yes. Lord Mower Man-esque situations yeah. meets, well, virtuality as it was meant to be in the 90s and was always a bit rubbish back then. But this is something that, in your experience, because you've, you've had a bit of a go at this, Yeah, I've had a go. I work. tried this when it was still just running in a, in a garage, in a suburban garage. So I sort of followed it along its so progress. So you ran into and a wall really quickly, I'm guessing. No, well, that's actually... what It's pretty cool. When you get too close to the edge of the real-world space, uh, a barrier comes up in the virtual world that says, dude, two more steps and you're going to break your nose. So it's actually... <laughs> once, but once you know how that works, you actually have the confidence to walk and even run around in this thing, and you quickly uh, lose that self-awareness of what's going on is not real. It's the graphics aren't good enough for you to think that what you're seeing is real. Oh, nice. Thank but you. the physics and the latency and everything right, is, the works now? is good enough to trick your brain into accepting it. To the point where the first time I tested it, I walked up to the edge of a cliff and I really struggled to bring myself to step over the edge. Even though I knew I couldn't get hurt, that primal bit of my brain was going, dude, this is not a good <laughs> idea. Take a step backwards. And that was kind of when I realized that they've got something right there when they can trick you. you primitive sort of senses okay. into going yeah this what's happening drum, around me which you're using. Um, once you've done stuff like this it kind of spoils you for things like Google Cardboard and Gear VR and all that stuff where you sit down and sit still um, because this stuff is sort of the next generation of that so it sounds like they're actually they're, they're pitching at the same space that HTC is pitching at with their Vive headset which they're working yeah. through with Valve presuming HTC doesn't go broke in the meantime that they're pushing for that kind of realistic world yeah. The question is, is this something that is really only feasible? From my understanding, this is this is in a warehouse in Melbourne, yeah? Yeah. But they're running this at the moment. Is this something that's only really applicable in warehouse spaces? Or is this something that within, you know, a couple of years, basically none of us will ever leave our homes again because we'll just don these things in the morning? Systems like this could work in your home. Like the HTC Vive has sensors that you can stick up on the wall. The way zero latency works, it really relies on that open sort of a, a warehouse space and the cameras around the ceiling. But uh, they do have plans to expand. They want to set up in, in Sydney and a couple of other cities around the country. And even they're putting in fiber links. They're going to put in fiber links to all their sites. So in theory, a few people could be in Melbourne and a few people could be in Sydney, but they will appear side by side in the virtual world. And it's not just for gaming. They've originally set it up so you can book online, four people can go fight zombies for an hour on a Saturday afternoon. But during business hours, they're renting it out to business people. Like you might be a developer and you want to walk someone through the plans for a new building while it's still on the drawing board. You take all your plans along, they fire it up in the virtual world and you can show your client this amazing new thing. So they realize that while zombies are kind of good for showing And then shoot them in the back of the head when they don't shine off on the plane. Yeah. And then running around and turning into, you know, Die Hard in Nakatomi Plaza. But um, they realize that while zombies are great for showing off what it can do and getting people excited about it, the applications for this kind of technology goes far beyond sort of, you know, trying to play, you know, Wolfenstein in virtual reality. It actually can be used in all kinds of areas. Right, so basically what we should be doing in terms of developing the next level of entertainment is going back and watching all those episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation where the holodeck went wrong and making those happen, except for, you know, the bits where they nearly died. That is right? exactly what I thought of. As soon as they said to me, people will be able to bring in their own content, I said, so basically you've built a holodeck, you've built a holosuite, and people can just bring along whatever they want. And as you say, that doesn't always work out well. Don't play, don't build Moriarty out of Sherlock Holmes. That never works out well. So, Alex, gaming isn't necessarily just sitting down in front of your computer screen or your television anymore. There's a lot of streaming and second screen sort of applications happening. What's, what's going on here? I know there was talk of it working with Windows 10 as well. What are we seeing happen? 
Okay, so the big new bit of news in this space is the fact that with Windows 10 having been released, part of that package is Xbox streaming. Uh, yeah. This relies on you having an Xbox One. Unfortunately, it doesn't work with the Xbox 360 and a PC running Windows 10 on the same network. In theory, you fire up the Xbox app on your Windows 10 PC, you plug in an Xbox One controller, and whatever's running on your Xbox One, as long as it's a game, will run on that screen, which has that kind of ideal thing that all of these second screen streaming experiences go for. Your main TV's busy because somebody wants to watch a TV program or play a different game or whatever, yeah. and you want to play a game and you can't, well, this way you can through your PC. That's how it works in theory. But it's not, while Microsoft is promoting this as some brave, new, wonderful thing, and their implementation is interesting, it's got its pluses and its minuses, it's not entirely a new thing. Sony's been doing this for years across a range of hardware, and even Nintendo, who are usually quite cautious when it comes to this kind of stuff, have in fact been doing it for, well, since the launch of the Wii U. Yeah. Now, I've, I've had a bit of a play around with the PlayStation 4 doing it to the, is it the PlayStation TV or the Vita TV, yeah, whatever yeah. they call it, the, the little yep. set-top box that you you can plug in and though I was actually surprised at how good that was although obviously you're you know kind of at the mercy of the conditions of your home network um that and again that's what it occurred to me is somebody wants to watch a movie in the lounge room I want to watch play the PlayStation you can even pause the game walk to the other machine and pick up where you left off mm. um it's not like you've got to shut it all down and start it again um does this mean that we're just going to play games 24 7 I know Tony was even talking about letting you use it remotely over the phone networks, although I don't think they've actually let you do that yet. It sounds like that all you need you is a virtual enough. reality if headset got, to okay. go with it. If you've got um, an Xperia phone yeah. and you've got a meaty enough upload pipe, and we're in Australia, so very, very so few people not. do, yeah. but if you did have a meaty enough connection at both ends, in theory, you can do game streaming to an Xperia phone outside network and obviously there can be some port issues with that and the quality can suffer a little bit so that is theoretically possible but this yeah. is largely an in-home technology um, you've highlighted though one of the problems that it has and this is across all three this is whether or not you're streaming to a windows 10 pc from an xbox one whether you're streaming to any of the range of hardware that sony offers it on from playstation 4 or if even if you're streaming to the wii u gamepad and you know how much i love a big props so i've been bought a big prop yeah, man loves these big props i love a big prop um, um, of all of them, the biggest problem that you will face is lag. And this yeah. is true even inside a decent home network. I've tested all three of them across quite a decent new 802.11ac router, and you still get frame drops and dropouts. Individual frames, look, you can deal with it because you're always kind of, you're doing this as a second best experience. It's still the case that they expect that you're going to be gaming on a big screen TV most yeah. of the time. This is for those times when your main TV is busy. And so, you're willing uh, odd... to put up with some compromise if it means you can keep playing while someone else is watching Pride and Prejudice. Exactly. Most of them tend to drop it to around 720p or worse. Yeah. And again, on a smaller screen, that's not necessarily a problem anyway. But all of them will suffer from lag to some extent. A small skipped frame here or there in most games is not killer. But for some of them, and I've hit this with every single platform, you will have those periods where it just glitches out or it just says, oh, look, I can't actually find the machine anymore for some reason. It's like I'm sitting in, in my living room with a laptop on my lap going, it's over there. I can <laughs> see it. Why can't you? I can throw you and hit it from here. <laughs> yeah, and I mean you've got there, there are other complicating issues the, the the Windows 10 implementation and to be fair they say it's in beta and these days when something gets released to consumers and they say it's in beta that essentially means look yeah we know this crashes all the damn time yeah. you're going to accept it because we've said it's in beta and it is it and you're does gonna crash test it for us thank you very much yeah it does crash it will crash that's fairly inevitable that's no better or worse than the competition to be fair. Yeah. But it does crash and it will crash. And obviously also being Windows, it's also subject to whatever else your Windows 10 PC is doing. If it suddenly decides, oh, better do that malware scan. And oh, look, some updates have come in. Got to reboot. Bye. Yeah, it happens. Um, but the competition has its own little individual quirks. The, the, the Wii U, I, I love playing on the gamepad. It's quite nice. It's quite neat because you get the small screen, but you get exactly the same controls as you would because it's exactly the same way that you play it if you're playing it on the big screen TV. Mm. But not every title supports that. An awful lot of them use this as an, in an on-screen map or a different kind of controller selection. So games like Splatoon or Zombie U, for example, no, there's no second screening in those. Whereas for on the Sony side of things, of course, they actually want you to cough up a bit more money in order to do it in the first place. You've got to buy a PlayStation TV. You've got to own a PlayStation Vita and put up with it slightly not quite PlayStation controls. 
or you've got to use it via an Xperia phone. And that's it's it's kind of it's one of those experiences where it's kind of cool tech. You can go, hey, I've got this tiny screen that I'm playing my PlayStation 4 games on with a real PlayStation 4 controller. Hang on, I'm playing on a really tiny screen. <laughs> well, that just about wraps it up for another episode of Vertical Hold. If you've got any comments, leave them on our YouTube page via Facebook or hit us up on Twitter. Thanks for joining us, and if you like what you see, hit that subscribe button.